going to start this event. We have, first of all, this is going to be a joyful, a joyful memory of art as only, uh, as art would want. Um, and uh, there's going to be time, though, normally I end Dean's forums, hi Cliff, normally we end them at, uh, at one because the memories may continue, people should feel free to leave if they want to, but we'll continue somewhat past one if people have memories that they still want to share. Because we have really quite a remarkable assemblage of people here. Um, but I, I want to start, before we really begin with the people in this room, I want to start with, a, uh, with something that David Wolper sent us, who was very sorry that he couldn't be here. And here's what he sent us. He said, here's the tape of one of Art's funniest speeches. It took place at a USC event in my honor, that is in, in honor of David Wolper, who you all know was a close friend of, of arts and maybe many of yours. The actual speech runs about 20 minutes and I cut it to nine. I chose the parts that refer to art at USC and a number of examples of art's hysterical stories. I hope you pass it on to the group that because of my Parkinson's disease, I'm crushed I can't be there, but I hope you all enjoy seeing art doing what he loved, making people laugh. Let's all laugh with our art <laughs> It is now my turn to talk about our honored guest. My relationship with David Walper goes back to our days at USC when we both worked on the college humor magazine, Wampus. I was managing editor and David was business manager. And Dr. Hubbard, I think I can tell you now, that not all the receipts from Wampus were turned over to the school. <laughs> Each month, as we counted the money, we said, this dollar goes to USC, and this dollar belongs to us. <laughs> Why, you may ask, were we never caught? The reason, Dr. Hubbard, is that when we turned our receipts over to the director of publications, he counted the money in front of us and said, this dollar goes to USC, and this dollar goes to me. Even in those days, Walpa was a visionary. David and I used to spend our afternoon sitting at the foot of Tommy Trojan and talking about our futures. What do you do when you get out of school, I asked David. I want to go into television, he said. What's television? <laughs> I asked him. It's a new form of entertainment, he replied which will bring moving pictures right into your living room. I laughed at him. Why would people want to sit in their own living room? <laughs> when they could go out to a theater and spend three dollars to see a picture. I don't have an answer to that, he admitted. But I just have a feeling there is money to be made in this business. What I plan to do is go out and buy every foot of film I can get my hands on. Hollywood isn't going to supply any product to a medium that is going to put them out of business. And then I'll sell the film to the television stations and make a mint. You're crazy, I told him. <laughs> no, I'm not, he said. I have a friend who bought a picture on venereal disease <laughs> from the army and sold it to a TV station in Los Angeles for $50. They put it on Sunday night in prime time and it got a 50 share of the audience. Walpa was getting to be a man to be reckoned with in television. I was living in Europe at the time and had been hired by the Belgian government to write an English commentary 
on a film that had just been completed about Belgian shotguns. The entire film took place in the Liège shot shotgun factory and showed workmen engraving guns with hammers and chisels and carving the wooden stocks from scratch and shining the barrels until they glistened. It ran for 45 minutes. After I finished the film, the Belgians asked me what I thought they should do with it. I didn't want to tell them the truth. So I said, you have to put it on American television. How do you do that? He, uh, they asked. And I said, I happen to know the best distributor of shotgun films in America. I wired Walper. Have tied up exclusive American rights on how Belgians make shotguns. We'll sell it to you for $100. Walper, in typical fashion, wired back, we'll offer you 50. That film, ladies and gentlemen, played every television station in existence in 1951. Not once, but 12 times. Although Walper has been associated with many distinguished productions since, I like to believe he's receiving this award from USC tonight. <laughs> for making all Americans realize how much debt we are in to the Belgian shotgun. It would take me all evening to list the great television projects that David has been associated with during the past 30 years, but he told me if I wanted to, I had all the time in the world. <laughs> Needless to say, the only one that David Walper will be remembered for, besides Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, <laughs> is Roots, the greatest dramatic series ever to be seen on television. Now, Alex Haley told you one story of how Roots came about. And I am going to tell you another. <laughs> David was at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., trying to find a property in the public domain. <laughs> so he wouldn't have to pay for it. When he heard a man in the next cubicle mumbling. And the first one from our family to come to this country was the African. His name was Kunta Kinti, and he came from a river, Kambi Balongo. And he was captured, and he went into the woods to make a drum, and later married a girl named Belle, and their child was a girl named Kizzy. Walper said to the man, what are you doing? <laughs> the man replied, I'm looking for my roots. I can only trace them back as far as the slave ship that came to Annapolis. If I can only find where the Kambi Balongo River is, I could make the Book of the Month Club. <laughs> David said, that's simple. The Kambi Balongo River is in Gambia. <laughs> How do you know that, the man said. 
We all learned that in freshman social studies at USC. <laughs> Well, the rest is history. <laughs> Alex Haley's chance meeting with David Walford, an alumnus from the University of Southern California, which was the only school in the nation that made the study of the Combi Bolongo River a required clause, <laughs> gave him the final clue he needed to write the epic of our time. Call it serendipity, if you will. But I like to think David Walper had just gone to the right school at the right time. <laughs> Dr. Hubbard, I know that USC does not bestow awards on its alumni unless they can bring honor to the school or give it enough money to buy a new library. <laughs> Tonight we are paying tribute to a man who can do both. I am proud that I knew David Walper at USC. I am proud to know him now. Every time I hear the Trojan fight song, my eyes cloud with tears. And I think of my college buddy hunched over his wooden desk in the Wampus office, saying quietly to himself, one dollar for the school. <laughs> at one dollar for me. Thank you. How many of you were here? Were there some of you who actually were there for that? I mean, were there, there for that oh, evening? Oh, I, were there any who were there that evening? Here with him. Yeah, of course, many of you were here with him. And, and I'm going to ask you to talk about your memories. And we also have here a lot of other people who, who loved him in many different ways, including uh, people here at, at USC. I want to tell just a quick story or, or two myself, just to open this up. Um, I knew Art well in many contexts, partly because of being the dean here and getting to know him better that way. But we both had homes in Martha's Vineyard. And we were both part of broadly the same circle in Martha's Vineyard. So we knew each other well in that, in that context. Um, and I had known him for a great many years. And so uh, when Art was sick, as you all know, he uh, was in a hospice. And you all know the stories about Art in the hospice and maybe have and I'm going to show you some exclusive photos here. Uh, and so Art was in the hospice, and you know, I thought it would be nice to go visit him, that he'd be lonely in the hospice. Well, it turned out that Art had more people around him in the hospice than we have in this room now. He was always just surrounded by people. This is, I want to tell you about some of these pictures. I took with my little trio cameras the pictures of Art there, because I never thought to bring a real camera with me. But Art uh, was actually thriving in the hospice. He was, he was very happy there. He was surrounded by all kinds of friends. This particular picture is Lucy Hackney, who probably some of you know. Art was always in love with a number of different women. We'll hear from some of them today. But Lucy was one of them. So I asked Lucy if she'd give him an adoring look that he could have. Of course, I didn't know he would survive to have that adoring look you know, for some time. Um, he thought he was about to die. But as you know, he did not die. He, what he's wearing here is the a uh, medal that he was given from the French, this was the French Legion of Honor yeah. medal that he was given. And he was very proud of that medal, and so he called up his good friend Bill Styron, part of that same Martha's Vineyard group that were friends, and he said, I've just gotten the French Legion of Honor. And he was very proud, he told the star, and Art said, you only got one. <laughs> Art had gotten two, I mean, a, a, a Bill had gotten two. And so Art then he had to sort of make up for only having one Legion of Honor token on, but he was still happy with that. And you'll see at the end, 
that we gave him some other gifts of which he was very happy, including um, Amy Chenoweth's story, which I want to talk about later. Um, but do you have the picture of, of Art uh, of him with uh, uh, on the telephone? Uh, well, one of the there some here. There's a picture here of Art on a on a uh, on a telephone while I'm sitting there, and he's you know got the succession of people who are coming. Uh, George Stevens and and um, uh, and Ethel Kennedy and all kinds of other people are coming through and seeing him during the, the time that we're there, and rabbis who gave up on him and priests who thought they had a shot at it, and he was <laughs> <laughs> you know, people uh, But one of the things that that Art did during that time was uh, the, the picture that I wanted to show you of him on the phone. He got a call from Tom Brokaw who also gave one of the tr wonderful tributes at the memorial service in Washington, D.C. that we actually have here. We might show it to you later. And of course, he was here for the wonderful tribute we had for Ed Guthman a couple weeks ago. But so Tom called him while I'm sitting there. And Art says, Jeff Cowan's here. Tom said, oh, let me talk to Jeff. So he gets on the phone. And Tom says, I have a great idea for a play, but I don't want you to tell it to Art. So I'm listening to it. Looking at it. And his idea was, and I thought this was a wonderful idea, to have a play of Art in the hospice, reliving his whole life. Because Art was holding forth in the most marvelous way. And actually, Tom even discussed it with John Gare, the man who wrote uh, Six Degrees of Separation, as a possible play. So you, all of a sudden, I'm sitting there thinking, oh my god, I'm in the middle of a play, and now i got to watch what I say. <laughs> but one thing which Art did while we were there was, Art was, among other things, enormously generous, as you all know, and we're later going to be able to speak to some of that and Bryce will to the wonderful scholarship that he, that he created here for our students. Um, but uh, Art's generosity also extended to asking for generosity for others. So he had a couple of friends uh, who had grandchildren who wanted to get into USC. Um, and uh, so I'm going to describe to you how Art tells this story, since rather than using my words, I'll use his. Uh, and in his last book, we got, Jeff, we have that? In his last book, he tells the story, which was called Too Soon to Say Goodbye, which many of you have probably read. He tells the story of his dying wish. It's amazing how many people visit you if you're in a convenient location and they've told you're going to die. I take full advantage of my situation in order to get people to do things for me. For example, the dean of a fancy California university, that would be ours, <laughs> who's also a good friend, called and asked if I wanted anything or if he could bring anything. I replied, yes. My, and that was actually a longer episode than this, but my dying wish is this. Would you arrange for two young friends of mine to get into the freshman class? It was a weird request, and I doubt the dean has ever been asked to fulfill a dying wish of that kind, but he said, if it's really your dying wish, I'll try. By chance or not, both girls got in. I made not only the girls happy, but also their parents and grandparents. The grandfather of one of the girls sent me three cheesecakes and three food baskets from Zabar's. Uh, of course, he kept getting these. He felt that since he was, he was dying, he could also eat all the cheesecake he wanted to. And his friends thought they could sell him all the, send him all the cheesecake that they wanted to. So he had a continuing stream. Anyway, when it turned out, that Art didn't die, Art then started renewing his wish for more students. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens next year. Um, I think everybody here has their own Art Buckwald memories, and uh, I want to start with some of his classmates. And maybe B, you could start off by uh, by talking about him some. And I want you to feel free to tell stories, uh, uh, sentimental or uh, ribald or funny, as you choose. B. Well. First, I, I would like to, for you all to remember Art, to realize what SC was like in 1944, or 19, well, 1944 and 1945. It was a completely different university, and particularly for these students than you have now. Uh, it was the, the w women who were here in the School of Journalism, which we had a terrible time getting in because Papa French, who was the dean, didn't think women should be in newspaper work. Yeah. And, <laughs> so, so we were all having a rough time, and all of a sudden these, these veterans come back on the GI Bill who had been drafted right out of high school, and they're all three to four years older than we women in the School of Journalism, and, and it was just, it was a riot. I mean, it really was really funny, and Art, of course, was one of those. 
Now, a lot of people think he was in the School of Journalism. He never was, but he certainly wrote a marvelous column, and I hope you have all those columns someplace in the archives. That's the, we, Jeff, it would be a good idea actually to bring out his columns. Okay. And, um, and I was, uh, and Cliff Dechter was an, uh, sitting here was one year behind me, I think, and, but you were still part of all that. And these guys, the Ted Shields and, and um, David Wolper and um, uh, so many of the, the great guys who really were the greatest generation, as we, our friend Tom Brokaw has, has named them, and they were just back here, men, men that had been in combat, fought in, in P-38s and bombers against Japan and Germany, and, and in the trenches and on the aircraft carriers, and this was, you know, these were sophisticated guys, and we were just little fresh, uh, freshman <laughs> uh, girls from, from around here in Los Angeles and small towns around Los Angeles, so it was a wonderful time. Um, and the, uh, Art and Jess Unruh, were both uh, classmates, and um, and they the two of them between the two of them they converted me from being a Republican from Whittier to a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they they had so much fun, and between the Wampus and the and the Daily Trojan, it was it was just school was just so much fun, wasn't it, Cliff? And it was. Um, I can just remember so many things. The guys all kind of palled around together, and they sort of adopted me. And I can tell you, I would never have gotten through the law of the press if it hadn't been for them, because I'm sure Papa French wanted to, to get rid of me. But at any rate, I did get through law of the press and, and hung on there. And uh, But I have a, a wonderful story, too, about maybe you've heard that he produced a, a musical while he was here on campus called No Love At All. Because he had been on an atoll, I guess that's the way you pronounce it, in the Pacific. And he wrote this musical, and it was produced here at SC and made quite a splash. And he thought, well, I'm going to go to a motion picture producer and have it produced. And he sent it to, I don't know who it was, someone at Paramount or MGM. And they called him in. And he was called in to this producer's office. And as he was sitting there, the producer, of course, was on the telephone to someone else and saying, you know, it's a great show. I'm sure Brando would love to do it, and you know all this. And Art thought it was they were talking about his show. And <laughs> so when when he got off the phone call, the producer said, "Who are you?" And he said, "Art Buckwald." And he took a Manila envelope and slid it across the desk and said, "Get this shit off of my desk." <laughs> so that was his first rejection. <laughs> And um, Ed Raby, who was one of our journalism classmates, had been a flying ace in Europe. And he and Art and George Anderson and Ted Shields and Russ Burton and Al Hicks and Dave Walper all hung out together. And Ed Raby was going to be here today, and I was going to pick him up and bring him. But he fell and broke his hip, and he is now in the VA hospital. But I talked to him last night and, and got some of his remembrances of, of Art. He was one of the guys that went to Europe, followed, followed Art to Europe after graduation. And he and his wife, Bev, lived in Verona, Italy. And they became travel writers at the Los Angeles Times as among their, uh, their clients. And so Ed and Art would visit each other back and forth. And Ed was in Paris uh, and visiting Art one time. And Art said, you know, since I'm writing this column from Paris, he said, everybody thinks that I own France. And he said, the other day, a two, two girls came in with a banner 35 feet long, and it said, beat UCLA, and they wanted me to hang it on the Art to Triumph. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who those girls were. I wish I knew. And um, it, it, it's, he just, if, if you can have ever read any of his columns from Paris, they were filled with just the greatest humor and and making fun of celebrities and, and royalty and and uh, it was they were just wonderful reads in, in the um, Herald Tribune and then of course he went to Washington and became syndicated by the Los Angeles Times syndicate and when I would go to Washington to visit him he would take me to lunch and we would sit there at his table where he held court and everybody I met more Washington people through art than I ever did through any of the jobs I had. 
and it it was just hysterical to to have lunch with him and all all of that. His the wonderful thing about Art is that he was humorous, but he was never mean, as so many of our humor people are, like John Stewart and Coburn are now. He he was always funny, and of course his favorite. T uh, person was Richard Nixon to make fun of, and I think one of his quotes is that uh, his favorite president was Richard Nixon. He wrote, I worship the very quicksand he walks in. <laughs> 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 my first trip to Europe, uh, Art took my husband and me out to dinner, and he insisted on ordering the dinner. And uh, he, I was just a little girl from Whittier who'd never been any place, and uh, all of a sudden this dish was put in front of me with these shells and a pincher <coughs> and everything, and he told me how to eat them to take this these things that were in the little cases and get it out, and of course it was scarago, and which are snails for any of you who didn't know, because I didn't know, and, um, and I felt, you know, very, very sophisticated when I left Paris after seeing some of Paris with art and, and being taken to dinner by him. <clears throat> My favorite memory of him is our 50th anniversary of graduation from USC in 1998. He picked me up in a limousine, I was his date for the evening, and we arrived in town and gown in style. And art, and that was art style since he was the main speaker. And following our uh, the dinner, he, he and I walked hand in hand around the campus because it was well lit then and it was great. And he he was, he loved SC, he was so proud of it. Now he'd made a lot of fun of SC in, many times, but boy at the end, and thanks to you too, he, he really felt a tremendous loyalty and a part of SC. And uh, he, he laughed his way through life and took us with him and we all bask in his wit and his fame, and I'm just so happy that his humor lives on. And all of you students, if you haven't read his books, please go get them, <laughs> because you will have a laugh a minute. Thanks, B. And B, I must say, I think Art had many people he had a crush on. My feeling was he always had a crush on you. <laughs> well, I don't know, but um, we're good friends. OK, so who wants to have other, other people have memory? Cliff, did you want to share a memory? Yes, well first I'd like to thank you for remembering the past as well as the present. And I think you've been very generous to Art, who, of the many folks, the combination of Walter and, and Bookwell is, is remarkable if you think of all the things that David did. Uh, but journalism in these days was on the fourth floor of the Student Union. And in the southwest corner was the newsroom, and on the east side, there were two or three offices. One was sports. That's where I used to hang out. And here were these two characters next door, the Wampus guy. And they were funny people in the hall. And uh, I said to someone at the time, Art will be the only one to ever make money out of college humor. <laughs> and there are a lot of people who have tried it, but he was the only one. Do you remember, B, when Art took David to the Academy Awards at the Shrine dressed as a gorilla? I, I remember something about him. That's yeah. true, a true story. He got the limousine, he just yeah, he reminded me with the limousine, and then they come up and they open the door and here comes David Wolpert as a gorilla. <laughs> it shows you the type of humor that they started, and uh, he was a very they, funny, and for David to go on with his own career over the years. It was interesting that started out on that Wampus office on the fourth floor of the Student Union. Great. Other memories? Yeah. And maybe you could introduce yourselves as you do it, too. I'm Ken Downs. I was a columnist. Oh, and Ken. I used to edit, try to edit a blog. <clears throat> Carrying back, he made fun of things, the role, the administration, and everything. Uh, but he was never me. Uh, and everything was always hooked to a fact. Um, <clears throat> for example, what, uh, before a football game, I was in the card section, I think. And Chancellor Tom Kleinschmidt came in in the big limo, and everybody gave him a courtesy hand. 
And then an old Ford convertible came by with George Tyrebrand. <laughs> 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 it exploded. Football Walter Collins was saying that Ron Kleinsmith, <clears throat> when he can't make certain affairs and everything, he should send Tyrebrand. <laughs> apparently, from this, I heard from over the grapevine that Ron Kleinsmith thought this was hilarious and a good idea. <laughs> but this Walter thing and No Love at All, No Love at All is a takeoff on the very huge Broadway hit of South Pacific. <clears throat> and Al Hicks was a co-writer of it. They gave it to me to read over. I, said, I didn't use the words. But that actually, it was an MCA agent. Oh, was it? <laughs> yeah. I said, this is just terrible. This is the worst thing I've ever seen like that. <clears throat> but they kept plunging around, and that gorilla, when Walter was dressed up in a gorilla suit, on his back was no love at all. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> I football would take it around in town trying to sell it to agents or producers anyway. And I said, how do you have the guts to do this? This is so bad. Three lunches. His columns, the thing is in his book, in his book memoir. When he talks about going to SC, he said he learned to write here. Well, he learned to smooth out his writing. His original co columns were kind of mumbled, jumbled up. <coughs> but <coughs> he smoothed out his writing, but his style remained the same all the way to the end. And some very funny stuff. And he talked about getting the Legion of Honor. Uh, Grace Kelly was going to marry the Prince, Prince Rainier. Rainier. Yeah. And apparently the wedding was going to hell be held in Monte Carlo. And to get tickets or get passes or credentials to this thing was impossible. He wrote a column saying that his great, great, great grandfather, so they're going back to the 13th century, <laughs> got in a duel. With a <laughs> they were going back and forth, and they would never go to any other function. Oh, he got an invitation. <laughs> <laughs> he, I, I, I try to remember, he loved women. I remember the case when we were going to SC, the car hop killed her husband with a meat axe. And they had a trial, a trial, and she was acquitted, self-defense. Well, she was a car hop in a drive-in. I don't know if you younger people know what drive-in. <laughs> Fast food places, and car hops were the waiters, waitresses. A lot of them came out on roller skates. You park your car out, they come and put a little dead tray on the door and serve you. Well, we said, go out and interview but the gal, the murder gal, went back to work as a car hop. Said, go back and interview her. What she did, came back with kind of a funny column and everything, and read through the thing and said, this is okay, this is okay, Art. He said, well, I have a date with her. <laughs> I want to see if anyone dares to try to top that. <laughs> Other, other memories of art from the period, please then introduce yourself to if you would. Uh, well, when I was here in the School of Journalism, I was Barbara Argue. I'm Barbara Bowen now. But uh, I, I worked for the Daily on the Daily Trojan, too. And uh, I always remember uh, art, he was always in a hurry to get somewhere. He was always out the door. But laugh, and we all left, we leaving us all laughing every time. And uh, after I left school, I left school and, and was married. And then, of course, didn't see him for years and years. And then one day, uh, I came out of a market in Covina at that time. And just as I was going out, he was coming in. And we both stood for a second and looked at each other. <laughs> 
And so then he asked me what I was doing. I said, oh, I live here now and I'm married. And he said, lucky guy. And he walked away. <laughs> but he was such a, a, a happy person to be around. Yeah, and Art I remember had Dr. French, too. <laughs> Art had been famously depressed, probably a lot of you know. And actually, one of the very funny and poignant pictures, there were three good friends who were all depressed together. One was William Styron, one was Art Buckwald, and the third was Mike Wallace, the CBS uh, News uh, uh, man. And um, one of their favorite pictures was a picture of the three of them together laughing, and this, the tag that they had on was three depressed men. <laughs> um, and Art did go through a period of depression, but for the last several years of his life, including this period while he was supposedly dying, he was amazingly happy. I think because he had finally found a medication that worked and overcame the depression, but he was an amazingly happy man those last years. Other memories of him? Yeah. Uh, Warren McLean, I signed in at SC in 1946 when I came back from the Navy, and uh, so I met Art then. And, uh, I was in journalism for those four years. Now, I think most of you know he didn't graduate because he left after his third year and went to France. He never got a degree here at that time. And I was telling him when I came in that the coincidence was that my aunt worked at Bullock's and as a buyer, and she had a young lady working with her who she said married Art Buckwall. And then when she and her husband, my aunt, my aunt and her husband went to Paris, we took them to dinner. But the thing I remember at SC was Art and Jesse Unruh led one of the great canvas revolts <coughs> because the student body election was, uh, put it this way, gently. the fraternity vote did some illegal things. They stuffed the ballot box. So Art and Jeff, Jess Unra pointed that out in the Daily Trojan. In fact, they, the fraternities even stole the Daily Trojan that reported this evil act. So anyhow, they had to call off the election and run a new one in the September uh, when they came back to class. We elected some fellow, well, I think his name was Bob Padgett. That's correct. Who turned out to be a traitor. <laughs> <laughs> Some people have long memories and long grudges. <laughs> <laughs> he signed, uh, but he always, after that, he famously signed the fraternity pledge. Yeah. 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 About Yeah. was the Wampus because it was terribly funny and satirical, especially at UCLA. And I had a, a cartoon I took out of the Wampus one time. I kept for about 20 years. These two editors of the Daily Trojan have a paper there that says, fight cancer. And the guy says, do you think we should take sides? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I graduated from SC and I was going to do uh, motion picture work, but I got called to the Presbyterian minister, which I, I'm a retired Presbyterian minister. I'd just like to read you something I wrote as a tribute to USC. It's a poem I wrote two years ago. Fight on for old SC, fight on to victory. I sang that old refrain at many athletic events while I was a student at the University of Southern California from 1946 to graduation in 1950. When I began my classes there, I majored in journalism, my favorite subject at Hollywood High School. Many of my fellow students were veterans of the Second World War. We all wanted good degrees to enable us to step up to good careers. The GI Bill sustained us through those lean, hard years they were lean. The real excitement was going to SC games and sports, especially football, although the city had many national titles in track and field with many famous athletes. But for football, we sat together in the Coliseum stands and lived and died with our teams, going to the Rose Bowl on some New Year's Day. These events created in us lifelong loyalties to the university and kept us hoping to beat our rival, UCLA. The journalism school was a special place for us because of the fun we had and the good teachers who showed us how to write good stories for newspapers, publicities, and reviews. Life was tough and we all had to have jobs to keep us going. There were fraternity kids who had more money than us lesser folk. And we fought them in our for campus offices. Those of us who wrote the Daily Trojan newspaper believed we were special because we covered all campus events. 
those were our happy days. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd no, just to quit. In those days, there were only four accredited journalism schools in the U.S. Really? And SC so won a major award every year. Northwestern, Missouri, and USC. That's right. That's right. We had to make more of that. I didn't yeah. know. That. And, and we That's couldn't, very we couldn't go to, I know at one time I wanted to go to the University of Missouri, and we couldn't because you couldn't get transportation that time. I mean, it, you know, it's just, I know the students today just can't realize what the United States was like in those days. And, and how different it was, and to be with, with, with these guys back from, from combat, uh, and their sense of humor, all of them had a sense of humor. A rapish sense yeah. of humor. <laughs> In a minute I'm going to call on one of the other members of the greatest generation, and it'll be an interesting bridge to another part of the conversation, but just with other people who were with Art here, yes. Uh, my name is Ed Balkan, and I was one of the returning veterans from World War II, and I didn't know Art personally, but I read some of his stuff. But I want to say something about the School of Journalism when I entered it in 1948. Um, it opened the door for me to clarity, how to write, what's good, what's bad. It embellished my sense of taste. And I remember Roy French, and I remember his idiosyncrasies, and he was a tough, guy to work for, and I feel that the tradition, for instance, of taking the page, putting it up somewhere, everybody critiquing it, it was filled with red marks, was such a wonderful educational experience for me. What I took away from the School of Journalism when I went here has lasted my entire life. That's lovely. That's lovely. Don't you wish the Los Angeles Times headline writers today had gone to the USC <laughs> School of Journalism? <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be so long down there. And that's <laughs> class from Julia McCormick. Oh, Julia oh, McCormick. Oh, I did too. Yeah. You know. Well, <laughs> <laughs> everybody in her junior year had to take this two-unit class in English. Oh, and she was the I, toughest yeah. teacher I, I remember. ever had. I remember. The end of the first week, you were afraid yeah. to write your own <laughs> now, one thing I'm going to suggest is that when we finish remembering Art, uh, people who are his friends should stay around afterward and you can share memories with each other and so forth, and we would love to have you do that. Uh, Ed Guthman was another member of that greatest generation and, of course, was the, you know, won a Pulitzer Prize. And the, actually, Ed, your Pulitzer was while some of them were here, Pul 1950, right? Yes. 1950 won the Pulitzer yeah. Prize, of course, was... Bobby Kennedy's press secretary and the national news editor of the Los Angeles Times, editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer, and for the last 20 years has had his highest calling, which has been uh, as a great professor here. Um, and, uh, and I'd love to have your memory. Well, I just wanted to point out that uh, Art, in his, uh, whether he was writing from France or from Washington or wherever he was, he always checked everything he wrote. He did not write those columns off the top of his head. He checked everything, and he would come back, and he wanted to be accurate. And I don't know where that was, but he, he had this great writing ability, and he, uh, his columns were wonderful, but he checked everything out. He was probably afraid that Roy French would come haunt him. Great favorite words. French taught us. Accuracy, accuracy, yeah. accuracy. Um, as kind of a bridge, I want to play a... Um, a piece about uh, about uh, art that was done by one of he's had so many favorite friends and students here, but one of them uh, was Kara Phillips, who also uh, spoke along with Tom Brokaw at this wonderful tribute for Ed Guthman, and we thought it'd be interesting to see her tribute. She's in Baghdad right now. Jeff, last hey. night was <laughs> in Baghdad. Jeff, last night you had an exchange of emails from her from Baghdad, and she sent everybody love here and is thrilled that this tribute is going to be on. She's an alumni. And she's long as well. Hey, welcome back. Thank you. Did you have any messages? It was one of the last times I saw him, back in October. So, Art, I've known you for 20 years. Where do we start? Where do you start? Well, we start at a heck of a place. It's a hospice. <laughs> he was in a hospice and laughing about it. 
I remember the first month, all my buddies showed up, all of them. It was like Radio City Music of all. They used to say at the beginning, have you seen the Lincoln Memorial in our buck wall? Oh, no. It's true. When Art decided he'd had it with dialysis, his doctors told him he had less than three weeks to live, so he checked into hospice. Everyone came to say goodbye. Mike Wallace, Ethel Kennedy, Tom Brokaw, Ben Bradley, Walter Cronkite, the Queen of Swaziland, and yes, me. Uh, no, I'm not one of Art's famous friends. I mean, look at his life. Betty Bacall and Humphrey Bogart persuaded Art's wife Anne to marry him. Lucille Ball brought her kids over to visit. Hanging out with Paul Newman, Duke Ellington, and Eddie Fisher was just another day in the life of Artie. But I was one very lucky college student, given a pretty challenging assignment. Interview Art Buckwald and live to tell about it. The year? 1989. My headline? Columnist Buckwald. The laugh started here. Very nice article. I hope you got an A in it. <laughs> I may not have received an A on that article, but I did earn something far more valuable. A friendship, a pen pal, a mentor, and a man that continues to teach me life lessons. I want USC to win a game once in a while. <laughs> Thank you. Give me a fight on, Artie. Fight on for USC. <laughs> da -da -da -da. And there he was, in a hospice, a place where people go to die. I find it funny about all the things that have happened to me since I've been there. It's an unbelievable experience because after two and a half months, I've had a chance to say goodbye to everybody in my life. Everybody in every walk from my orphan asylum days to the Marine Corps, to USC, to Paris, to today. And I've gotten uh, between 3,000 and 4,000 letters now from people. At 81, Art told me he was having the time of his life. Everyone he loved, a hard time, even his nurses. What do you love the most about him? I said to him. I said to him. Art, what do you love the most about your favorite nurse? She beats me up. You know what? Yeah. She doesn't give me breakfast, so she beats me up. Is that true? If you call giving him a good bath, beating him up, yeah. <laughs> and he look good? Growing up an orphan, Art used humor to cope. He never imagined it would define his career. He joined the Marines to become a man. He went to USC to become a writer. Then Art bought his one-way ticket to Paris to become famous. It worked. In the next half century, there would be more than 8,000 newspaper columns, more than 30 books, and a Pulitzer Prize. Art checked out of hospice in June, kept writing his column, and wrote one more book, Art Buckwald, Too Soon to Say Goodbye. It's still too soon for me, but now it's time. Goodbye, Artie. It's a lovely piece. Uh, there are a lot of people have, since uh, in the last few years who have felt the connection with art, and it's really in large part because of Bryce Nelson, who had the idea of starting the, uh, the Buckwald uh, Prize. And maybe, Bryce, you could talk about that. I, I first uh, ran across art, I heard him speak in, in England. And he brought down the house of the Oxford Union from his first words on uh, that uh, when I was director here in the 80s, I uh, read that he and, he and Edward ben Williams had this contest, whoever Whoever won the Notre Dame USC game, the other one would have to contribute money to a scholarship for Red Smith, the great sports writer at Notre Dame. So I wrote a letter and uh, I said, people at USC wouldn't mind a scholarship name for Art Buckwald. And I was sitting in the faculty meeting once and somebody came running down the hall and said, Art Buckwald's on the phone. And every director is glad to be, get out of any journals of faculty meetings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was sort of this rambling voice that said, uh, Christ, do you think it would really be appropriate to give money for a scholarship and then name it for yourself? I said, Art, it would be 
universities do it all the time. We love to have uh, an art Buckwald scholarship. So he, he uh, gave a scholarship, and for those of you who haven't heard it, he gave the best criteria for a scholarship ever written. The student should be anti-establishment and contemptuous of the scholarship he or she is receiving. That is to say, he or she should be willing to bite the hand that feeds him or her. If the person's on probation for something that he or she wrote, that should be considered a plus. <laughs> In actuality, very few of the winners of the Art Buckwald Scholarship have been on probation. One of the things that Art was always very generous in, uh, in meeting with the, with the students, whether in Washington or here, in coming to our classes, in speaking for every school at USC to help them raise money. Uh, he, was, he was always sharing his, uh, uh, what he had, uh, to operate, as well as giving several thousand dollars for the scholarship. And uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I remember, we, we sent one of the winners out. We have several winners here today, Amy and Kim and Andrew and, and others. Uh, and uh, we sent out one guy to pick him up at the airport and won the scholarship, and he was driving an old beat-up 82 Volkswagen Bug, and, uh, <laughs> and Art said, well, I haven't ridden in a car like this for a long time, but uh, I'm glad that you need the money. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a wonderful tribute, Bryce, and a great thing that you started, and I want to just make sure that we have a chance to meet all the uh, previous winners as well as the current winner who are here. Andrew, do you want to, maybe I can ask people to just introduce themselves, their previous winners. I'm Andrew Dalton, I won 2002 and 2003, um, and got a chance to meet Art quickly after, thankfully after he already gave me the 10 grand. <laughs> 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 I told him I really needed this 10,000 because I have pretty serious moves and drug habits. <laughs> 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 but uh, we got to have a conversation. His hearing was going and I'm a chronic Mumbler, so I, I don't think we, I don't, I'm not sure we had the same conversation. But <laughs> I, you know, he went to talk about the events today, and he insisted uh, this was just uh, two years of the current president's first administration that he was the worst, the worst president we've ever had. And I said, come on, all right, you know, U.S. Grant, Warren Harding, and he assured me that having covered both the Grant, <laughs> I said for certain after just two years. <laughs> Other uh, other winners who are here, uh, Amy. I know you're. In fact, I had the privilege of one of the three visits I played to Art in the hospice. I took Amy's column back and we read it together, which she really loved, partly because of the subject matter, also because of the writing. Amy, do you want to describe this? I'd love to. Um, so I wrote about um, anchor women in Los Angeles and um, the overabundance of cleavage basically across <laughs> anchor desks in the Southland. And um, the story actually ran in the Daily News and they put a photograph of, I don't know if you, if you still live here, but of Lauren Sanchez. And she's like a very endowed anchor woman. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you told me that when you read him the article and you showed him the picture and he saw the picture, he was like, is that Amy? <laughs> Before we introduce this year's winner, is there any other previous winner that's here? Well, I'm delighted that we have, I hope we have here, the, the current winner. Uh, and is this the place where we're actually bestowing the award? Uh, I know, Bryce, do you want to give the award? Why don't you? No, why don't you give the award? Well, is there an actual check that we are about to give? No. <laughs> there will be a check. The check, as we it's say, it's either, it's not just in the grave, it's in the mail. Uh, Kimberly Cunningham is the, Kimberly, uh, do you want to just say a word about it? And we just just for a minute talk about you know what you've written about and what it means to you. Well, I just wrote a very sort of uh, personal piece about Starbucks. It's called the Starbucks Drip, and it's about a woman who uh, you know drinks her coffee, and the coffee always drips. And it's also kind of about boobs because you know, <laughs> uh, the coffee always lands. Um, in the most inappropriate places, and just sort of about the neuroses that it spills over from just these tiny little drips of coffee. And, uh, and so I, I just was so surprised 
to win, and I'm just so honored, and especially being here and hearing everyone's stories, and I just feel like it's a beautiful close to a two-year experience. I'm a second-year graduate student and about to go off into the world, and it's just, it's just such an honor and to be the recipient of any award that bears his name, and so glad he named it after himself. But, <laughs> <laughs> It's just an honor. Okay. So. Well, congratulations. <laughs> what we thought we would do is to is to conclude with some clips from the uh, Kennedy Center Memorial to Art, which I think some of you, I wasn't able to be there. I don't. Was anybody here actually back there? Mm -hmm. They're wonderful. Apparently, the high the the high points included uh, Ethel, Ethel Kennedy, Kennedy, and by the way, Kathleen Kennedy Townsend, her daughter, was here earlier this week in this room just a couple of days ago. But Ethel Kennedy gave a great tribute. Tom Brokaw gave a tri great we'll tribute. And, and Art's family wished they could be here, but they said they'd love for us to show these two pieces. And as with all of our great events, of course, Jeff Baum has produced this. And Jeff, you do such a great <laughs> job. And after this is over, after we see the tributes, people who want to stay for a while and remember and uh, congratulate, um, please do. <laughs> What I loved about Artie was that he was funny and that he knew that humor would trump whatever life threw his way. That he reluctantly checked out of the hospice, partying all the way, getting along on one leg, claiming his day there was the time of his life, astounded and delighted us all. As much as he wanted to shuffle off this mortal coil, still, the imp in him loved that he beat the rat. Decades earlier, this lovable genius agreed to become the godfather to our youngest children. A Jewish godfather to four little Catholics <laughs> wasn't exactly what the church had in mind. <laughs> In fact, they were pretty much against it. <laughs> Luckily, the new pastor at St. Luke's, just over from Portugal, hadn't quite caught on to a second language. <laughs> <laughs> Father Pereira's English may not have been so hot, but Artie's familiarity with the rites of a Catholic baptism turned out to be equally sketchy as we discovered halfway through the ceremony. <laughs> when it came to the part where the priest asked, do you renounce Satan and all his works and pomps? Oh, he lost it. <laughs> he turned pale, fled to the back of the church, and collapsed on the folding chair. <laughs> Asked what was the matter. Highly agitated, he spluttered, I'm not ready to renounce Satan. And all the <laughs> One hot summer day, shooting the rapids of the Colorado, we unexpectedly ran into Gregory Peck. Omar Sharif and Julie Nomar, filming the Western McKenna's Gold. We all agreed to meet later on for dinner, where we had a contest for who could recite the most romantic poetry. Imagine soaring to the moon as Greg, with his steady gaze and sublime voice, sought permission to count the ways. Next up was Omar, with his lovely liquid eyes and soft tones hinting of desert mysteries, whispering a Shakespearean sonnet. Then, like a freight train, <laughs> Artie burst the moment. Imprisoned in a bulky orange K-pop life preserver, worn 24-7, just in case the Colorado overflows. 
he brought us back down to the linoleum countertops of the Moab Motel cafeteria in the earthy Brooklyn accent of, this, of his childhood, undaunted, art waiting with this little gem. If you can't be a pine on top of the hill, be a scrub in the valley, but be the best little scrub by the side of the rail. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. He didn't win the contest, <laughs> but he did win our hearts. As George alluded to, for 20 years, he reigned as the ringmaster of the Hickory Hill Pet Show. Dressed in a cheerful red coat, white jodhpurs, and black derby and boots of a master of hounds, he submitted, he, excuse me, he substituted a megaphone for a trumpet. Together with Rowley Evans and Phil Shayman, he judged the array of animals in the homemade show ring. A lot of conferring went on among the judges. Several of us felt that their whispered deliberations were more about the mini-skirted ribbon-givers <laughs> than the furry, feathered, and fanged entries. Art saw to it that no child left the ring without a ribbon, including the poor little kid who brought the moth he found that morning in the toilet. <laughs> the first time I played tennis with Artie was the first time Artie played tennis. <laughs> it was at Hyannis Court, and we were up against mountain climber Jim Whitaker and a highly competitive Andy Williams. Apparently unaware of any dress code, <laughs> Artie showed up in a dark t-shirt, long black shorts, tall black socks, black high tops, and a Marine Corps cap. <laughs> the other team never had a chance. <laughs> Forget the ball. They couldn't keep their eyes off Artie. Which, thinking back on it, was exactly what he intended. Sometime later, we were playing at Hickory Hill. Artie's game had become more serious, but not Artie. Running to the net, he tripped over a bump on the court and fell down. Getting up, he accused me of bearing boomers there. Art learned to drive in his 50s. He got himself a Lexus, but he didn't let on that he was afraid to drive. The only indication was that the moment he walked into a party, he'd line up his ride home. It kind of made you wonder what went on on the drive over. <laughs> Artie was the real deal, and a Marine to boot. Brightener of the day, we miss you. Artie, having lunch with you for over three years was a kick. Next time, it's your turn to make the reservation. May Jack and Bobby take care of you, who took such wonderful care of the children and me. Goodbye, old friend.
So many of these eloquent tributes to him have reminded me of that last year and the many conversations that we had, feelings about his faith. One of the things that he looked forward to was meeting Judas. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know, did you betray him or not? <laughs> I've been living with this my whole life. I need to tell me. When I asked him what he was going to miss, he said global warming. <laughs> <laughs> Meredith and I met Art in 1973 when we were moving to Washington from California. It was not a happy prospect for Meredith because we had just moved into a new beach house in California, and now she was faced with the drudgery of finding a rental in Washington in August. She came home at the end of the first day in much better spirits because she had met Art Buckwall, who had a house that turns out was too small, but his heart was so large and he was so helpful and friendly, she thought maybe this would work out okay. A few weeks later, I was on duty at the White House. The press corps there still treated me as a probationary member of their group, wondering whether I was worthy of their fellowship. It was at the height of Watergate, and Art showed up to get some material for his column. And of course, in those days, it caused quite a stir to have someone of his caliber appear in the White House press room. And when the briefing was over, Art with that odd little pipe that he used to smoke, walked across the room and loudly invited me to be his companion at lunch. As he put it, you want to have lunch at the cafeteria. And off we went to his table at San Susi. <laughs> it was the Washington equivalent of the Grand Ruby inviting a goy off the street to celebrate Passover service. <laughs> or the Pope asking a novitiate to help him celebrate Christmas Mass. It was, as they say, the beginning of a beautiful friendship. And with Art, that meant, of course, it was not confined just to Meredith and me. It was a family affair. Our daughter, Andrea, who insisted on being here today, was a student in London the summer of his serious trouble with depression. She was unaware of that. But she wrote to him at the vineyard to say how much she was loving seeing his column in the International Herald Tribune, how much she missed him. He told me later that the idea of a young person loved his stuff gave him a lift. And so he wrote back, and they began a regular correspondence and a lifelong relationship. Andre went off to Berkeley, and if Art were going to be in the Bay Area, he would call and announce, hey, you're going to be my dinner date tonight. He'd greet her with a dozen roses, and she'd meet him and his friend Herb Kane and Art Hoppy in a San Francisco restaurant and call us later, still laughing to say, Dad, these guys are older than you are, and they still crack me up. <laughs> <laughs> My mother treasures the time that she was visiting us in New York, and Art called for one of us. We weren't home, so he talked to her for 20 minutes. <laughs> If you were part of that extended family, of course, his greatest gift, his humor, came with extra dimensions. His readers got a few column inches every week. His lecture audience always got a fresh run through of laugh out loud topical observations. But his friends got the handcrafted original good enough for Broadway material. When Ethel was turning 50, that must have been, what, four or five years ago now, right? <laughs> Guests at the birthday party were asked to come in costumes that related to her life. A tennis player, a skier, a golfer, a cop handing out speeding tickets. Art showed up in a full nurse's outfit, his hairy legs sticking out from his dress, a nurse's cap framing his round face, and with a cigar in hand, he began to read from what he called the diary of a mad nursemaid. <laughs> I will share with you now just some of the excerpts. March 23rd, 1978. I 
can't believe it. Glory be to St. Anthony. My dreams have been answered. I have been hired by the beautiful and gracious Mrs. Ethel Kennedy to be a nursemaid to her adorable and delightful children. <laughs> Mrs. Kennedy had me to tea to explain my duties. She said they would be simple. Just look after the children, keep them neat and out of trouble, and see that they brush their teeth. Could anyone be blessed with a more satisfying or easier job? <laughs> I think I'll want to live at Hickory Hill for the rest of my life. Day 2, March 24th, 1978. My first day on the job, the little darlings all got up when I asked them to, dressed for school, and went off laughing and full of life. Mrs. Kennedy told me after they had left that the cook had just quit. And she wondered if I minded cooking for the family until they found a new one. I said, of course not. And she said, fine, there will be 30 for dinner tonight. <laughs> when I asked her what she wanted to cook, she said, anything simple as long as it's fresh from the sea and could be cooked with a white wine sauce. I was about to leave for the shopping when Mrs. Kennedy said, on your way, do you mind picking up Anthony Shriver at Eunice's and taking him to Dulles Airport? Then go over to the National Airport and pick up Carrie and Kathleen, bring them back here, and then take Max to the eye doctor and leave Dougie at Georgetown Hospital for x-rays while you drive Lori for her riding lessons. I said, of course I'd do that. Mrs. Kennedy always asked so little of her staff, it's hard to do that. <laughs> I made it back at 4 o'clock. Mrs. Kennedy called from the pool house to tell me that the gardener had just quit. <laughs> she asked me if after I gave the children their milk and cookies, would I be allowed to mow the lawn in the back of the house and cut down a large tree by the barn. I said, I would love to. Mrs. Kennedy said, I was like a daughter to her. <laughs> she then told me the maid had just quit. <laughs> and wondered if I might freshen up the guest rooms for Jim Whitaker, Andy Williams, Governor Terry, Prime Minister Trudeau, Rayford Johnson, and the front four of the Los Angeles Rams. <laughs> I did, and got back just in time to make the diapers and to set the table. Mrs. Schreiber then called from a payphone and said she was stuck in the bellway and out of gas. Mrs. Kennedy asked if I would be a deer and go get her. <laughs> I picked up Mrs. Schreiber, came back and served dinner. Afterwards, as I was washing the dishes, she came in to tell me that the projectionist had not shown up to show the movie. And could I do that? And when I was running the movie, it started to rain, and the roof began to leak. Mrs. Kennedy asked if I would go up to the skylight and repair the roof. Day 3, March 26th. <laughs> Kennedy is free this morning in the laundry room was not exactly what I had in mind. I said she didn't have to pay me for the three days because it really didn't seem like work. <laughs> Mrs. Kennedy, gracious as always, thanked me and said I would always remain like a daughter to her and I was welcome to come back at any time. You were in privileged company if you got that kind of treatment from art and sometimes it could be a little taxing as well. When I left the Today Show to come the anchor of Nightly News between that time and when I was going to the evening, the Brokaws and the Stevens went on a family trip down the Nile. I was nervous about leaving because we we're going to be out of touch and if something blew up in the world, how would they get in contact with me and could I get to the story in time? We had just gotten on the shirt and boat at Abu Simbo completely out of touch, and there was a young woman who kind of assigned to look after us. There was a knock at her cabin door, and I opened it, and there she stood in a towel with her hair wet. They called her out of the shower. She was almost hysterical, saying there's been a terrible emergency, and they're sending a telex to you. But we don't have facilities here, so it's going to a military installation down the river, and then a man on a donkey, true story, will arrive <laughs> with the telex. I was... Uh, as you might expect, in a state of high anxiety, wondering whether it was some personal tragedy at home or something big had happened in the world. And off she went to retrieve the man on the donkey with the telex. She came back about 45 minutes later with a large roll of telex paper and stood there anxiously at my side as I began to unroll it and read the traffic. 
XNBC Washington, XNBC New York, NBC Cairo, Cairo Defense Ministry, back to New York, back down, and I continue to roll it and unroll it and unroll it. And finally, I got to the message itself. It said, Dear Tom, Elizabeth Taylor has left Senator John Warner. <laughs> <laughs> He will tell you his side of the story exclusively if you return immediately. <laughs> I looked at the young woman and said, it's a joke. She said, what do you mean it's a joke? <laughs> and so we carried already with us on that memorable vacation as we did on so many other occasions. <laughs> Yesterday, by chance, I drove by the New York Mental Hospital where Art's mother was institutionalized throughout his childhood. It's a desperate place. And as I drove by, I thought about our friend and his two sisters being shuttled from foster home to foster home, their mother missing from their lives, and their father absent most of the time. How easy it would have been for all of them, Art included, to give up and to become lifelong victims of self-pity. That was not Art's way. He survived with an iron will and the need to have people love him, which he quickly learned came much easier when he made them laugh. When he ran into an obstacle, he found a way around it. Scorned by a girlfriend, he joined the Marines. USC discovered he didn't have a high school diploma, and he went to Paris. When Sinatra called one night in Paris wanting to go out and already made an excuse to stay in, he knew then it was time to come to Washington. And when Dr. Newman told him his choices were a little longer life or death, Art chose death and wound up with a bestseller, appearances on all the television networks, a song in his honor, and a visit from the Secretary of Defense at the time, who was not even talking to the Secretary of State. <laughs> <laughs> this last year has been his lasting gift to all of us. He made us laugh again. And he made us understand in the most welcome fashion that a good death contains as many profound lessons as a good life. Please, God, make sure he has a good table <laughs> and lots of people to set, stop by. Semper Fi, my friend. Semper Fi. So thank you all for sharing this last set of memories with us, and we'll all carry art with us in our heart. Um, and stay as long as you like, and continue to visit and share memories, as we all will. Thank you all. Thank you.